Once again, that's Acts chapter 16. <clears throat> Acts chapter 16, the title of my uh, sermon this evening is A Saying to Do More in 2024. A Saying to Do More in 2024. Um, usually we don't, you really won't hear that word a say uh, much in our modern vocabulary today, but a say simply just means to make an attempt, which means that you're, you're determined, uh, this can be inwardly or so, but whatever your determination is, you're basically looking to make an, an attempt to do something, to uh, make something come to pass or go after anything. But the context here in, in chapter 16, it actually goes back to chapter 13, uh, where Paul and Silas, uh, excuse me, Paul and Barnabas are sent out of the church of Antioch for their missionary uh, journey. Uh, there comes a time where there is a split between Paul and Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas end up taking Mark with him. Uh, Paul end up taking Silas with him. In chapter 16 here, Paul picks up another young man on his team, a, a guy named Timothy. It's also known as Timothy. And um, when we get to uh, the second, the second missionary journey of, of Paul, and this time he has uh, Timotheus with him. They are uh, hitting many different cities. They're, they're going through many uh, cities and they're preaching. They're hitting many different churches. And let's pick up in verse five, because verse five is where we're going to start to get our title from for the message. The Bible says, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So we see here Paul and his company are traveling about there. They have in plans. They have cities that they, they're looking to map out and they're looking to go across these cities. But if you notice in verse five, verse five is a really important verse because verse five says, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Right. Think about what he said there. The churches that they went through on their missionary journey, their second missionary journey here, the churches that they hit, they were established in the faith. And it said they increased in number daily. But then here's a, a, a catcher right here. Verse six says, now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, then it said, verse seven, and they were come to my seal. They are saved to go into Bithynia, but the spirit suffered them not. You say, well, what's the big deal about verse number five? Because verse five says the churches were established in the faith and they increased in number daily. But then yet we see that in spite of that, verse six, they're looking to do more. They don't get comfortable. These churches are established. They are settled. They're growing daily in number. Yet Paul says we can do more. He says, we're, we're going to uh, say to go into this city and that city. And it kind of reminds me of what Pastor was preaching on this morning. He's talking about how we have seem as though we're, we're trending up over the past five years. Uh, we have an uh, increase in numbers uh, weekly and monthly. And we see yearly that the numbers are going up. Uh, tithes and offerings are, are going up. And we see the baptisms are going up. The salvations are going up. It seems like everything is going on on an upward trend. But one thing we have to be cautious about is getting comfortable. Where, where to a point where we're just hitting these trends and we're hitting these peaks and then we're just taking a, a, a bit of ease. One thing we don't see in verse five is where when they are establishing these churches and they increase in number daily, you don't see where Paul and the rest of the crew say, ah, let's limp back. These churches are established. But no, actually, in verse six and seven, they say they are saved to go into this city and that city. What we see is that they're attempting to do more in spite of churches getting settled and churches getting uh, increased daily, getting people getting added to the church. We see that there is a constant uh, urgency of growth from Paul, where they're looking to do more. And that's something that we can take from this, where don't get comfortable when we go into 2024, but we got to uh, say, we got to attempt to do more. 
We see that there was a increase in verse five. We see that they increased and were settled daily and, and grew in number daily. But then verse six, let's going to we're going to see the saying we're going to see the attempting. Look at verse uh, six. It says now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden. You say, well, it didn't say they made an attempt. Well, yeah, it didn't. But look at the context. It said they were forbidden, which means that basically the Lord said, no, don't go here. Well, that means that they made an attempt and they were forbidden. They were not able to go there. And then Paul didn't just throw up his hands and say, well, I guess there's nothing else we can do. No, verse six, uh, excuse me, yeah, verse seven says, after they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia. So we've seen two attempts, verse six and verse seven, where Paul has this, uh, this attempt, this saying to do more, him and his team. And we see that they have a desire to do more. Here's I'm going to leave you with one point today. It's a short message, of course, so I'm only giving you all one point today. The one and only point is actually a statement. Here's the thing. If you are, are saying or attempting, if you are a saying to do more for God, God will open doors for you. If you are a saying to do more for God, God will open doors for you. You say, how can that be? Because it say everywhere they went, the Holy Ghost forbid them here. They tried to go to my city. The Lord said, don't go there. Well, look at verse eight. God finally opens the door for them. Verse eight says, and they passing by my city came down to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. They were willing to do more. They were a saying they were attempting to do more for God. And God eventually opened up the door in spite of some doors being shut. All the doors were not shut. God had a door open for them in spite of their saying, in spite of their attempts not being successful. Now, here's the thing. From the text, we can see that it may not always go according to your plan because Paul had a plan to go to this city. They had a plan to go to that city and the door was closed. Things may not always go your plan when you are attempting to do a work for God. It may not always go according to your plan. It may not always go according to your setup. And in Paul's case, it may not always go according to your location that you want to go to. But yet, in spite of that, God is still able to open up doors. Here's the thing, especially when it's uh, a work that you're trying to do for God, especially when it's according to God's will. God will open up a door. You say, how can that be? Well, think about what Paul was trying to do. Yes, God was closing doors. But what was Paul trying to do? He was trying to go around and preach the gospel. He's trying to settle churches. He's trying to establish churches. He's trying to start new churches. And of course, is that not God's will? That is God's will. So eventually, in spite of him a saying and attempting to go to this location in this city and doors closing, God had a door open for them. And that's something for us to take courage. I personally uh, took courage from this passage of, of scripture in general, because I think about, you know, with what we have going on in uh, in in Atlanta here with Stronghold Baptist Church, Atlanta. How, you know, Pastor just mentioned it earlier, we're on the upward trend. It seems like things are going good. But, you know, one thing we're not looking to do is just have that flowery bed of ease where we're just sitting back and comfortable. No, it's been in the bulletin for a while that Greenville is a place where we're looking to do more. We're looking, we're saying to start churches in different cities, just like Paul did uh, here in the book uh, in the book of Acts. So as we're a saying to start this church, you know, I'm encouraged and, and I pray that everybody else is encouraged by it because, you know, this here made me take courage because Paul is going to this city and that city. And, you know, it seemed like, you know, me and Pastor on a weekly basis are talking about buildings on a weekly basis. And it seemed like doors are getting shut. <laughs> seemed like you have a door open and this one gets shut. And it seemed like, you know, I think like, will this even come to pass? Is this even God's will? But then when you open the word of God, yes, it's God's will. Yeah. 
to start churches any and everywhere. Will it always be easy? No, we see that with Paul and the rest of the guys. They're trying to go here, trying to go there. God said, no, don't go there. I don't need you here. I don't need you there right now. Doesn't mean that area won't get touched. But listen, God still open up that door eventually. And I'm convinced and I'm taking really good courage out of this scripture because I believe that eventually that door will open. Yeah. Yeah. That door will open. And, you know, all the labor and, and hard work that goes behind it right now with us trying to find this building, it, it will be well worth it. And it's the last thing I'm going to touch on. And I'm, I'm shutting it down here. I think about, you know, this was another thing that made me take courage because the Macedonian call. You know, I, I figured that, you know, yes, pastor, he could have took the flowery bit of ease and say, you know, we're on the upper trend. The church is growing daily, weekly, monthly, just like the church here in Acts. And just like Paul and these guys didn't say, well, hey, that's that's all we're going to do. They are saved to do more. Pastor, even in 10 years of ministry, is looking to do more, yes. looking to do more in 2024. And, and I'm all for that. And I believe that there are people in Greenville who just like the Macedonian people saying over here, come over here. We, we need to help over here. And it's not just people who attend here who live up there in Greenville, but the people who don't know us, people who would get say that someone just come and answer that Macedonian call. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the. Um, for the uh, ability to hear your word and be encouraged by it. I pray, Lord, that we all get fired up and are uh, excited about this uh, church plan and uh, what you have for us in 2024. And we ask, Lord, that uh, you would be with us and let your will be done. In your son Jesus' name, amen. amen. Amen, church. Um, you go, uh, go ahead and start opening your Bibles to um, we'll start off at Psalms chapter 55 as I get prepared. Okay. All right. Uh, Psalm 55, verse 22. The Bible reads, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Father God, we thank you for just taking all of our burdens. We thank you for being who you are, and thank you for being God of all, and uh, just allowing for us men to be able to preach in this church and to grow. We just praise you and thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, the title of my sermon today is Leaving the Bags Behind. Leaving all that bags behind for 2023, starting off something new in 2024. What type of baggage do we probably have? We probably have people in our life, family or friends, talking bad about you because you go to a church like this, saying you're in the cold. We have family, friends. You probably have that pet sin of yours that can so easily beset you, that thing that's your baggage of 2023. You have your finances that's probably affecting you, probably saying, you know, like, or you're probably saying, well, I want to go so I want to do more, but my finances are not right. Uh, some people, especially of age, they probably have the health that's affecting them and it's causing them to not do more. And so, like, we have all these things taking place in our life. And so instead of us looking at those things and saying, hey, I'm going to let that hinder me from doing what God has called me to do, we can still go out here and still do more. Amen? Amen. And here's the thing. I brought this tape here because here's the thing. A lot of this stuff can affect us where it ends up making us, you know, um, unfruitful, unprofitable. And it does damage to us. So another, like a subtitle to the sermon could be damaged goods. We have things in our life easily besetting us, a lot of things in our life that cause us to uh, not be fruitful when it comes to the things of God. And you see how this box here has a tape. Well, when you rip it off, usually it takes off. So a lot of this stuff 
that happens to bother us, so easily beset us, a lot of that ends up doing damage to us. Our sin does damage to us. The things that people say to us when they talk about that we're in the cult and they try to hold us back from doing the things of God. Yeah. Sometimes our finances, it hurts us. It hurts us in our walk with God. Sometimes even our health. When you could be a three to five person and your health is just taking a toll on you and instead of you being in the church, you know, for Sunday morning and Sunday evening and then Wednesday night, a lot of times people have health issues, financial issues. Sometimes people have transportation issues. Well, when it comes to the things of God, instead of allowing those things to hinder us, we should be able to speak up as a church. We're a church family, and we should be able to talk to others and say, hey, I'm struggling in this. If you have a sin, talk to somebody and say, hey, I'm struggling in that. If you have some situation financially, talk to somebody and say, hey, look, can somebody pick me up so I can come to church? So I can, you know, get Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night services. You know, be able to open up and say, I want to be a part of church. I want to be able to go further in the word of God. Amen? Amen. Don't let those things hinder you. Because here's the thing. All of us go through something, right? And I'm going to go to uh, John chapter 16, verse 33. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to be able to read it because of time's sake. It says, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world, you should have tribulation. What's another definition of tribulation? Troubles. What's another uh, definition of tribulation? Issues. In this world, you're going to have issues. But what is, also, what is it saying here? But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So even when it comes to the things going on in the world, when you have trials, when you have tribulations, when your finances are not looking right, when your health is not looking right, when you got certain things bothering you, instead of you being quiet, tell people in the church, hey, I got an issue going on. Can somebody help me? You know, we should be a church that's able to come to somebody and say, hey, if you need help, you got my hand. You, you got me to help you. I'm, I'm able to be a support to you. Amen. Yeah. Because what do we start with? We started with uh, Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast thy per by burden upon the Lord. He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But here's another thing. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When you come to a church like this, when you have burdens that are, that are from outside the church, your job having a uh, job causing you issues and you have family members causing you issues, family members that say they don't want to be a part of you now because of the church you go to or what you stand for, because we stand hard on the sodomites, we stand hard on certain things that other people in the world are against. When you have people going against you and your job saying, hey, you need to work on Sunday, but you say, no, I don't want to work on Sunday, and then you end up losing your job for that sake. When you end up getting persecuted for the things of God, you need to come to this church. You need to be around people that do care about you because we're your spiritual brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. Amen. In 2024, instead of us carrying the baggage, instead of us having all the issues that we have, let's leave all that behind. Because you know what? In the end of the day, this world's going to pass, right? It says here, Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, For our light, get this, the Bible's calling it light. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, Paul went through some things. You know, you look at the book of Job, Job went through some things. These men of God in the Bible went through some things. And I'm glad to know, hey, look, even in 2023, when I had left that church, my wife, like a lot of people calling her and going against her and saying, why did your husband do this? You know, it's good to see somebody else that was on the same shoes as me, Brother Preston and his crew, going through the same thing where I have phone call after phone call telling me, hey, look, you shouldn't have left. Having persecution happened to me, but you know what? I stood my ground. I came here, and you know what? I'm serving God. I'm doing way better. My family's doing way better. And you know what? I even got persecuted at my job because they wanted me to work on Sunday. But I said no. Yeah. I lost that job, but you know what? I got a far better job. Mm -hmm. So you know what? Things are going to come against you. You're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulations. But as long as you stand with the word of God, as long as you let that baggage go, and you move forward, like the Bible said, what Pastor preached on this morning, Press toward the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. When you do that, God's going to be with you. He holds with you until the end of this world. Okay? So I want all of us to take that with us. 2024 is going to be a great year. We have an awesome church. 
by far one of the best churches in the world. Right, and I say that boldly. Mm -hmm. So let's make this year a great year, 2024. Let's go ahead and uh, close out in prayer. Father God, we thank you for Strong Hope Baptist Church. We thank you for all the lives that are here, the, all the people that are doing the work of God. And no matter what trial and tribulation takes place, God, that you will cover us, that you will strengthen us, you allow for us to be strong for 2024, and that we do way more than what we've done last year. So God, we just praise you and thank you. Uh, bless the other man that's coming up to be able to preach the word with boldness and to also uh, give clarity to our minds so that we can be able to take notes and take something with us as we go home. We praise you once again. We say this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you guys could grab your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 29. And while you guys are doing that, I'm just going to open up a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to come up and preach the Word of God, Lord. Father, I pray that you'll fill me with your spirit and with boldness, and I pray, Lord, that the words that are in your Word and that the, the message that you have put on my heart will be edifying to the church, Father. Thank you for everything that you do. In Jesus' name pray. Amen. All right, you guys should be in Proverbs chapter 29. We're going to... Um, <clears throat> Uh, my passage is going to be in verse 18, where the Bible reads, Where no wisdom is, sorry, where there is no wisdom, the people perish, and he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So I'm kind of following the same road that it seems like a lot of other people are following about a New Year's resolution. And what really inspired this for me was I'm reading a book, it's called Atomic Habits, and part of the thing that the author is highlighting is that when you're trying to establish new habits or you got goals to reach, whether it's in the new year or at any time throughout your life, if you want to change something, you need to have a vision for it. You need to have a system that will help you get there. And <clears throat> why is that important? Why do we do that? Why do we have New Year's resolutions? Why do we want to change different aspects of our lives? Well, it's to make us happier. And the Bible says that he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I mean, keeping God's law is not meant to be a burden for us. To the world, yeah, they think it's a burden. But for us, it is our freedom. We get freedom from sin by keeping God's commandments. And <clears throat> um, if you guys could turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. So my goal is not necessarily to sh show you how to make a vision or what your vision should be. But I'm kind of... Can, going to kind of give you an example on a good goal that everyone can have. And a personal goal of mine is just to grow in wisdom for this upcoming year. And that's a very broad term. Like I said, you guys can apply that however you need to. And I try to make this sermon very broad so that it can apply in many different areas. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, um, we get a story <clears throat> of a poor wise man. And in verse 13, the Bible reads, This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city and few men within it, and there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of, a, of wise men are heard in quiet, more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much. <clears throat> so we get here a picture of a poor wise man. And it's, it, it kind of reminds me about how in the, in the law... God tells us that if we keep his commandments and if that we're faithful, then whole armies can be dispersed before us, sent to flight against two or one or two people. And, and just kind of imagine the circumstances that this city is in. It's a small city, few people in it, against a great king with great war capabilities, great war machines. And how was this city delivered? Well, it wasn't delivered by the city's own strength. It wasn't delivered by the men of war. It was delivered by a poor man 
who was wise. And to me, this kind of makes me think of a kind of wisdom that only can be given by God. Because, I don't know, like, we got some pretty wise people in this room, but how many of you think you can deliver an entire city out of a great ar uh, like out of the hands of a great army? That is a, a huge war machine. I mean, to me, that just seems like a great wisdom that only God can bestow. <clears throat> and after this great of a victory, we can see the conclusion of the matter. And it wasn't, it's, like I said, it's not based off of our own might. It's not based off of our own capabilities. But rather, it was delivered by wisdom. And I'm paraphrasing here, but the Bible says that the Lord has chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. So it doesn't matter if you're poor. Wisdom can be gained everywhere. It's not something that is hidden away. It's everywhere. You can read that in Proverbs chapter 1 and just throughout Proverbs. And, but one thing that it does say, it says the words of wise men are heard in quiet more than him that ruleth among fools. So wisdom, it's something that you really have to look for, pay attention and listen to. You have to listen to what the word of God has to say. You have to listen to the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Because if you're just letting the cares of this world distract you, you're not listening to what the word of God says. You're not paying attention to it. And also, one thing that, that really stood out to me was that at the end of the passage, it says, wisdom is better than weapons of war. Now for us, the Bible is our weapon. This is how we gain our wisdom. This is how we fight against the enemies of this world. That's how we fight against the devil and his adversaries. And in Hebrews 4.12, the Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So th th think of it kind of like this. When you're a warrior and you pick up your sword, you can't just never use a sword, pick it up and start throwing it around and be a skilled user with it. Same thing with the Word of God. It is powerful, but you have to know how to use it. You have to have the wisdom and knowledge. And you also have to have a vision on how it works, how you use it, and the best way to attack and defeat our enemies and to strengthen ourselves. So it has to be used with wisdom. And also that, wisdom is our is like it's, it's our riches. We get our riches in this lifetime from the Word of God. It's the most valuable thing that we have in this world. And in Proverbs 16, 16, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather, rather, than, rather to be chosen than silver? So, so one thing that we all need to do, and I encourage everyone to do just on a daily basis, is to get and receive wisdom. And like I said, you have to have a vision on how you're going to do it. And a great way to start is with the Bible reading challenge. Start by reading the Bible more. Like if you're only reading a couple chapters a day or nothing at all, start by reading, reading the Bible with this challenge. And like Pastor always says, read with the understanding. It is far better to read slower and not read as much, but to understand exactly what you're reading. And <clears throat> the Bible says, the heart of him that understandeth seeketh knowledge, and the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. So don't be a fool. Forsake the foolish things of this world. Put off the sins that so easily beset us, and get that vision for how you will seek wisdom, how you will serve God, because that is what will bring you joy and happiness in this world and ultimately impact the people around you. Because like, like the Bible says, it's one man that can change the course of an entire nation. It's one man that can stand in the gap that makes that difference. And we got a whole church full of people that love the Lord and that serve Him on a daily basis. So if one poor wise man is able to deliver an entire city from a great foe by his wisdom, then what can a church like Stronghold do when we're all wise with, and bestowed with that kind of knowledge and wisdom? What great things could we accomplish if we get a vision for what the Lord wants in our lives? and put, put our own desires aside and put the Lord's will before us. All right, thank you, and we'll close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for everything that you do, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to come up and preach your word. Father, I pray that you'll bless the next man, fill him with your spirit, and give him wisdom, Lord. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray, amen. If you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to be piggybacking off of Brother Austin. <laughs>
Ephesians chapter 6. The title of my sermon is to use your sword. Or if you want to keep the theme, you can say use your sword in 2024, you know. In uh, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse number 11, it says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take on you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. Uh, fill me with your spirit and, and uh, to uh, keep me from saying what I shouldn't say and to give me wisdom and to give me the right words that, that, uh, that people can understand. And uh, bless us as we go throughout this day and keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So uh, I want, I'm going to talk about how we need to use the Word of God. We need to use our sword. Um, as Brother Austin has already kind of talked about it, you know, the, the sword is our weapon, and we are in a great spiritual war. If you'll turn to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, but the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the Bible says that the Word of God... The, the sword that we're supposed to carry, our spiritual sword, it says it is the Word of God, and it says that the Word of God is quick and powerful. I mean, this, this book here is the most powerful thing on this planet. It is, it is powerful, and it's a, it's a living Word. It's not just some dead book. It is alive. And the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? I mean, the Word of God is powerful. It, 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 it's, it's amazing. I mean, when you read this book, I mean, nobody can deny that this is a divine book. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So the, the Bible is not just some book. It, it truly is uh, the Word of the Lord. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse number 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through, the, through God to the bowling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we're in a great spiritual war today. Uh, I mean, I don't know if, if, if you know this, but the entire world is against us. I mean, everybody hates us. I mean, the Bible told us that, that the world would hate us. And we can see governments hate us. We can see you know, that the homos out in the world, they hate us. All the false prophets, all the churches, religions, everybody hates us. And we're in a great spiritual war today. And the weapon that we have is the word of God. I mean, all of Hollywood, the media, everything is against us. It's all fighting us. It's fighting our families. It's fighting our children. It wants to take our, our children. It wants to, to brainwash them and to teach them lies. And the Bible says that we need to take the shield of faith. But well, what is our faith supposed to be in? It's supposed to be in God. It's in the word of God. So not only is the Bible our only defense in this war, but it's also our only weapon, and we need to use it. We don't need to just let it sit on the shelf. We need to pick it up, read it, and use it in our lives. Don't, don't just turn on the TV and, and, and just watch the TV. Use your weapon. Use your sword to, to fight against what, what the world and what the government and what everything is fighting us. We need to use our sword to, so that way we can stand. Because if we don't use our only weapon, our only defense, we will fall. And I want to make a, a, a specific um, application of this. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says in James 1, 18, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. So the Bible teaches that we're saved by the word of God. The word of God is what gets us saved. Amen. And the word of God is amazing. I mean, you think this is the, the same word that spoke all of creation into existence. It's the same word that spread the earth over nothing. It's the same word that, you know, uh, that, that split the seas open. It's the same word that Jesus used when he spoke it. It calmed the seas and, and it, it commanded the oceans and the seas. It's the same word that when Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to wipe out the Antichrist and all his armies. And it's the same word that when spoken, people are made to understand the gospel. It's the word that when it's preached, confusion, it, it becomes simple and we can understand. It's... It's not that we, can ju we just understand the gospel. It's through the word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. 
For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So the word of God has to be preached in order for us to even get saved, for us to even be born again. It has to be this word. It's not my testimony. It's not my life story. My testimony is not the power of God and salvation. This book right here is the power of God and salvation. This book is what needs to be preached. And so we need to use, we need to use our sword in our daily lives, but specifically our soul winning. When we're preaching the gospel to people, we need to use our weapon. If we're going out in a war, you know, if you think about like World War II and the, and the trenches, we're going out, but we have no weapon. We don't have our rifle. We're going to get slaughtered. We're going to get destroyed. We're not going to make any advancement at all. So we need to use the Word of God, our only weapon, to be able to preach to people so that they can, they can understand the gospel and they can believe on Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, your faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It doesn't say that it comes by my testimony doesn't say it comes by my, my, my own illustrations. It comes by the Word of God. And it has to have a preacher. I mean, the Word of God by itself doesn't get off the shelf and go and win people to Christ. It takes a preacher to actually preach the Word, but it takes the Word. It's not, it's not just the preacher. It's not just the Word. It's both. We have to preach the Word and use our sword in this war or else we're going to fall. We're, our families are going to fall. They're going to crumble. And we're going to let the devil take over and take over our kids. I don't want the devil to take my kids. I don't want the devil to take over this church. I don't want the devil to take over my community. I want to win. I want to fight. I want to strive, and I want to use this sword, the only weapon that we have, to be able to fight. And if we don't even open this book, we're, we're, we're setting ourselves up for failure. And I'll just go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to preach. And I, I pray that, um, that I was able to communicate uh, the message that I have in my mind, to take your word and to take your sword and to apply it and to use it and to, to use it for our defense, but also to use it for our offense. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'll go ahead and open up with a word of prayer here. Dear Lord, thank you for this time to come to church and to hear all these different sermons and thank you for the things we've heard so far and pray that you would just bless the rest of our evening help us all have safe trips home when we go later tonight and uh, pray that you would just fill me with your spirit now and uh, help me to preach uh, well and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 1 where it says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And the title of my message tonight is Endure Hardness. And if you don't like the King James Version of that, you could just say, Do hard stuff. Do hard things. Endure hardness. That's what the title is. Because right there... Paul is telling Timothy, endure hardness. And specifically, you know, he's talking about, you know, when you serve God, trials, tribulations, hard things, afflictions, they come your way, and you're going to suffer. That's the Christian life, right? And we can get that, you know, just knowing the Bible here, but also if you look at uh, elsewhere, I'll just read this. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. In the context of 2 Timothy in chapter 1, verse 8, I'll read this. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. For the which cause I also suffer these things. So when we're talking about in this context, we're talking about suffering, enduring hardness. We're talking about suffering for the cause of Christ, right? As a soldier of Christ, he even says, okay? So, you know, the Christian life is hard. Amen. It is if you're doing it right, right? Yea, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, the Bible says. But, you know, I'm going to be preaching something a little bit different tonight. I'm not going to be preaching about, hey, endure hard things when they come your way. I'm preaching primarily on, hey, put yourself through hard things. Amen. On purpose. You're like, what in the world? Are you talking about like self-abuse? I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about doing things that are hard but that are good for you. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. And dear hardness, because you know what? He compares the Christian life to being a good soldier. And I don't know of any soldier that, you know, is just a soldier. Oh, oh there's a war. Okay, well, let's go for the very first time. 
and I'm going to start to fight for the very first time. I hope I'll be good at it. And you're figuring out how to use the gun, and you're, uh, you know, you're tying your boots for the first time, you're sharpening your you, No, you need, a soldier prepares. There's a thing called boot camp, you know, and even in the Bible, you know, Abraham's men, when they go to rescue Lot, it's not like, okay, we got to go rescue Lot. No, how do we fight? No, they're obviously training, they're, they're prepared. Okay, so don't wait for hard things to come to you because we could live a very pampered, easy life in America. I mean, yeah, persecution is things, things happen, but, you know, I think in general, though, we could probably live pretty easy, laid-back, chill lives, All right? Amen. And we don't need to get too comfortable, too uh, at ease, Okay. We need to put ourselves through hard things. Well, I think, well, where does the Bible say that? Well, you know, you're in Matthew 16. Look at verse 24. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Yeah. That's you putting yourself through hard stuff. On purpose. Amen. But it's, it's not just, you know, you're not cutting yourself or something. You know, this isn't suicidal tendencies we're talking about. We're talking about doing hard things, doing things that are good for you, doing things that are the right things to do, right? Why? So you'll be ready for something when it does come your way. When things are external, then maybe you can be ready for it, right? Yeah. You know, when Jesus is picking his disciples, it's funny, he's picking people that are working. Oh, these fishermen, you guys, you're going to be my disciples, right? As they're casting their nets, you know what I mean? As they're mending their nets, you're going to be my disciples. You know, it's funny. He didn't go to the Romans that were just chilling out in their togas and just laying around all day. No, like eating grapes or whatever. You know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with eating grapes, but he's picking people that are working hard, people that have a little bit of discipline already in their life. They're working every day, right? I've never been a fisherman, but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's work. Okay, so, you know, don't just do the easiest thing that, can, that you could possibly do. Just take the path of least resistance all the time, every day. Just do what feels good. Just don't do anything uncomfortable. You know, we need to do things that are uncomfortable. That's, that's, the, that's the title of this message. It's endure hardness. We need to put ourselves through hard things. And, you know, you can apply this to so many areas. And I'm going to apply it to some right now. We can, you know, how about we skip, you know, just a meal every now and then. Mm -hmm. How about we skip the carbs, skip the sugars, because it's everywhere. And, you know, I know we're about to eat pizza, so eat the pizza. But I'm talking about, you know, if you're alive every day, just, you know, cereal, chips, and just, you know, every day, all the time, you're just, I mean, we live in this abundance. We can eat all the time, like Pac-Man. Waka, waka, just, you know what I mean? <laughs> the vast majority of the foods that there are are not good options, you know. So don't just let your, 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 your appetite just go unchecked. Amen. Because you need to sell, tell yourself no sometimes. Don't be like Solomon who just did never told himself no. You know what happened? You know, he said he hated life because he never told himself no. And, you know, we need to tell ourselves no. We need to deny ourselves and do the hard thing. Okay. You know, eat things that aren't fun. Eat the vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. Eat the whatever, the meat, right? Or maybe, well, that's fun, so I don't know. You figure out what's the hard thing, right? You know, get up early. That's hard. Get up early. Go out in the cold. Yeah. Go out in the heat in the summer. You know, sweat in a, in a you know, sweat out sewing in a suit, right? Out sewing in the heat. That's the, I don't like that. I don't go sewing in the summertime because it's not comfortable. Well, you know what? Do something hard anyways. Because people are dying and going to hell, whether or not it's hot or cold, whether or not you sweat or not. Why don't you do something hard, right? You know, why don't you read your Bible until it hurts? Why don't you do it until it's uncomfortable? Do it. You know, well, I just don't want to do anything uncomfortable. Well, I'd hate for the Christian life to be uncomfortable. I'd hate for you to have to endure hardness. That sounds like work. It is work. And you know what? It's good for you, though. Okay? You know, we need to be trying to use our brains, our minds, 
you know, learn things, you know, memorize things, you know, don't always use the calculator. You know, use your brain, think, learn until it hurts, until it's hard. It's good for you, right? Spiritually, we need to be doing spiritual things until it's hard. We need to be enduring hardness spiritually. Don't just do all the easy stuff. Well, I can't go to Stronghold. That's 25 minutes away. <laughs> yeah, tell that to the people that drive an hour, two, four, or whatever, right? Sometimes more than that, depending on, you know, where they're coming from. I hate for you to have to do anything hard that's spiritual. I'd hate for you to ever have to be bored, wouldn't we, right? Be bored sometimes. It's good for you. Amen. Don't just think you always have to have something entertaining you at every moment. Do something that's hard, and I'm not even saying that that's hard. But for these, these days, that is a hard thing, right? You know, we should be challenging ourselves. Lift weights, exercise. You know, think about things that are hard. Think about your weakness. You know, because some people might, yeah, I'm doing this area, right? I'm, I'm already doing whatever the area. But what about the areas you're not doing anything hard in? Mm -hmm. Think about that for yourself. Pick, what, pick your weaknesses and try to start doing things that are hard in that area, okay? That'll help you to be better. Well, how's, you know, exercise going to help me be a better Christian? Well, maybe you'll live longer, mm -hmm. and then you can serve God an extra 20 years. Yep. Right? Yep. You know, and just in general, you know, how about just being able to run up a, a, a flight of stairs out sewing, and, and you're not just, <laughs> hang on a minute, you know, I'm, you know, I'm from Stonehold. <laughs> Oh, sure. You know, you got, you got the book bag on. You know, th there's some practical things that, that, that could transfer over, you know. And I'm not trying to pick on you. If you I'm not trying to pick on anybody. So please don't think, you know, th hey, it's, it's New Year's resolution. You got to talk about starting to work on a diet, right? I can't just say the same things that all these guys have said so far. That's boring, right? I want to make somebody feel uncomfortable in a different way, you know. Okay, don't just take the easy choice. You know, I'm out of time, so endure hardness, okay? Yeah. Endure hardness. Go through hard things. Put yourself through something difficult, uncomfortable. Don't burn yourself out. Don't do too much. Progressive overload is the key. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, just do something that's a little bit harder than what you normally do, and then go from there, always pressing on the upward way. There's your song idea. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. <laughs> Dear Lord, thank you for this, uh, this popcorn preaching uh, men's night. And uh, for the opportunity Pastor Burson has given us all to just preach what's on our minds. And I pray that this was a blessing. And I pray that you just be with the last uh, preacher, Brother Peter. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. amen.